Last time, we talked about rate, or how fast, I'm sorry, what did we talk about last time? Yeah, rate, instantaneous rate, how fast we are going at some point in time. And that kind of introduced us to this first idea in calculus called the derivative. The derivative is the rate of change of an equation. We are going to use the same idea of objects moving to build our second idea in calculus. An automobile travels at a constant rate, so we're going to keep it constant right now, of 48 miles an hour. You do it for two hours and 30 minutes. How far does the automobile travel? What would you do to get the answer? How far you got? 48 times 2.5. We know that distance is rate times time, so all we have to do is 48 times 2.5, and we figured out we have gone 120 miles. Okay, make sure I'm not uncovering something I don't want to, because see, sometimes the secrets get revealed too soon. If I look at a graph where I have graphed rate, Sorry, rate on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. Rate versus time is how we would say it here. And if I'm going at a constant 48 miles an hour, that means there's my rate, a constant 48. And time is ticking off down here. One hour, two hour, two and a half hours, right over here. Do you notice that if I multiply that 48 times 2 and a half, I am finding the area of this rectangle right here? Because 48 is the height and 2 and a half is the length of it. I have found the area underneath this constant 48. Now, an automobile travels at an average rate of 48 miles an hour for 2 hours and 30 minutes. How far does it travel? This is okay. But once again, do you think an automobile that started in Gentry and then drove to Shreveport is going to be exactly 48 miles an hour when its average is 48 miles an hour? No. Some point in time, it may be exactly 48. It's going to be slower, it's going to be faster, it's going to be stopped sometime, it's going to be doing 72 miles an hour sometime. So it's going to be doing something like this. Still rate times time. I do know my time is two and a half. That is a fixed constant. But my rate may be starting at zero, that I speed up, that I slow down. Then I do this, then I do that, then I do that, and oh, we're going to stop when we get right over there. The distance traveled is going to be the area under this curve. But how am I going to get that area? That's where the calculus again comes in. How can I deal with things that are varying, that are changing? Suppose a ball rolls down a ramp and its velocity is always 2t feet per second. t is the number of seconds after it has traveled. So this is how we're going to get the rate or the velocity part of our graph. Uh, how far does the ball travel during the first three seconds? Let's use the same approach if I do a graph of velocity versus time. Now the time I know is three seconds. One, two, three, three seconds. I know my time. 2t, if I was going to graph that, what would it look like? What's that? Say a little louder. I think you said the right thing. The slope is 2, 2t. So when my time is zero, I have gone, or my velocity is zero. When my time is one, two times one is two. I've arrived right here. When I have gone two seconds, two times two is four. I'm going to have to change my scale. Two, four, six. Let me change my scale. Two, I'm up to four. When I've gone three seconds, my velocity is what? Six. So if I do that graph, that's simply a line with a slope of two is all that this thing is. There we go. So if I want the area under this curve to this point, what shape do I have? 
I have a triangle. We know from up here that the area under the curve is going to be the distance traveled, no matter what that curve, and when we say curve in math, remember that's just the equation, the thing that we are graphing there. So if I can just figure out the area under this curve, I know the distance traveled. So the distance is going to equal the area under that curve, which equals, how do you find the area of a triangle? One half base times height. One half base times height. So I can take one half, my base was three, my height, how tall was my triangle? Six. Half six is three, three times three is nine. How far does the bar travel when it's doing velocity feet per second? That ball has traveled nine feet, the total distance that we have gone. So if my area is a shape that I can recognize, I can answer this question. Limit at infinity. We need to cover up some of this stuff. When we write the limit of a function equals L as X approaches infinity, then we know limits mean that the value of the function gets arbitrarily close to this L as the x value gets arbitrarily large. We're not approaching a number anymore. We're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So let's go through a series of steps and see if we can answer this question. Oh, I even have the answers, but I think you'll understand. A gallon of water is divided equally, poured into teacups. Find the amount in each teacup and then the total amount in all the teacups. If you have 10 teacups, how much will be in each teacup? One tenth of a gallon, right? So I just take the gallon and I pour it into 10 teacups. If I add all those one tenths together, there are 10 of them, what will I have when I'm done? I have one gallon, I'm back to a gallon. Nothing complicated there. Let's keep going with that idea. I have 100 teacups. How much is in each teacup? One hundredth of a gallon. How much do I have when I add the ball back together? One gallon. Nothing's funny. I have a billion teacups. How much is in each teacup? One billion. Now, that's not very much, right? It's real small. But when I add them all together, what do I have? One gallon. An infinite number of teacups. Think a minute. One over infinity is the idea we're working on. One over n, n being the number of teacups, is what I have in each teacup, right? But now I'm taking this n. What's the limit of this as my n approaches infinity? Can you tell me what that equals? The limit means what will this approach, what number will this approach as this n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Zero, right? Is it semi-believable, at least, maybe even believable, that if I have an infinite number of teacups, I'm going to have zero in each teacup? That's the math idea. It's a little hard to wrap your mind around it, but could you understand how, okay, I see what they're saying. Because as I get more and more teacups, I'm getting smaller, smaller, smaller. What am I going to if I have an infinite? Remember, infinite's not a number I can count. It just keeps on going. If I have an infinite number, what have I gotten to? I've gotten to zero in each teacup. Now, are you ready for the next step? Add all those infinite teacups back together. How much do you have? Zero equals one. one I have one gallon. <laughs> I have zero in each teacup, but when I add them all back together, I'm back to a gallon. Once again, can you see how, okay, I see what you're saying. <laughs> this is the idea we're going to be working on now. So it is a little bit on the edge of what logic has been for us. That's what makes it fun. So let's look right over here at the notation of what's going on. When I wanted to get my one gallon back, I took how much was in each teacup, multiplied it by the number of teacups I had, and I'm back to a gallon. If I had one-tenth of a gallon in each teacup, multiplied it by my ten teacups, I'm back to the number of gallons. 
That's what this is saying right here. As n goes to infinity, how much am I going to have is the number of teacups times how much is in each teacup, 1 divided by n. Now, if I put n times 1 over n, well, that's just n over n, right? 1, I mean, n times 1 over n would be n over n. And n over n must be 1. That's the mathematical argument that this has to be true. But what is in each teacup? Zero gallons. Okay? But we're okay, because we're math people, so it's like, all right, I can believe that. Connecting area. This is what I was doing earlier. Connecting area is... How can I? Oh, well, I'll just let you see both. Constant 48, do it for two and a half hours. We know 48 times 2.5 gives us 120, which exactly correlates to the area under here. But what do I do when my velocity is not constant and it's doing something like this? I need to find some way to get an area in there. We're going to take that teacup idea. Let's just take small pieces and then add those small pieces together, and that should equal the whole. That should not be unbelievable, and that should be very believable. If I just add up all the little pieces, it should equal the whole. So the idea is, all right, let's just slice this up into all these smaller pieces. And then if I added all those smaller pieces together, I would get the whole thing. Now, each of these smaller pieces, remember I'm looking for a shape that I know the area of. We've had a rectangle. I know how to get the area of a rectangle. We've had a triangle. I know how to get the area of a triangle. Well, this could be close to a rectangle, right? That's a little bit curved, so it's not exactly right, but it could be close to a rectangle. So what if I made all these rectangles? So let's come down here, and we are taking part of a curve, and I am trying to find the area under this curve, and this happens to be the graph x squared. And I want to find the area from 0 up to 3. How much is under this curve? Well, I'm making rectangles, and I'm making the height of the rectangle, and there's a little one right here, based on the right side. So whatever the right side is, I come back. Whatever the right side is, I come back and make a rectangle. The right side, I come back and make a rectangle. If I found the area of each of these and added it up, how would that rectangle sum compare to the real area? A little bit bigger, isn't it? Because I've got these extra little pieces up here. I've got these extra things. It's a little bit bigger. But I'm on my way there. So if they say, use the six rectangles in this figure to approximate the area of the region below the graph, f of x equals x squared over the interval from 0 to 3. Well, I know the area of a rectangle is base times height, length times width, whatever you want to call it. And I know how wide it is one half. Why is it a half wide? Where did we get that? We can see it. Well, I went zero to three and I divided it into how many rectangles? Six. That's where it comes from. So there are six rectangles is what they are saying. So I get a half. So zero to a half, a half to one. So I know the base of each of those rectangles is a half watt. Now I need to figure out what the height of the rectangle is. Let me take one that I can see easier. Oh, let's not use that one. How do I get the height of this rectangle? How do I get that length right there? It's what? How do I get where it is on the y-axis? And I don't want to just look at my graph. Anybody, how do I know where my graph is at that point? Don't make it harder than it is. Trying to make it too hard. Where is my graph when it's 2? I just substituted 2. f of 2. My equation is x squared, so this is 2 squared. It's 4. That's how tall it is right there. So I say, you're trying to, we've gotten into this 
bigger stuff, and so you're trying to think too big. This is just simply, where's my graph when my x is 2? It's at 4. So when it's at a half, all they did was they substituted a half into my function. That's how I get my heights. It's just the value of the function at the, in this case, the right hand of that rectangle, the right side of that rectangle. And so we could get the area by taking how wide the base is times how high it is, and we just keep doing that. And we add all these things together, and that gives us an approximation of the area that we know is too big. We know it's too big. So right over here, we did rectangles where we took the right side of that rectangle and figured out, oh, we're going to use that for the height. That's the height, that's the height, that's the height. But we know it's too big because of this extra stuff that's right over here. So we could do it the other way. We could do it where the left side of the rectangle was the height of it. And then if we added all these up, what do you think this area would be? I'll call it area left. It would be a little small, right? I'm going to call this area right for a minute. So this area right was a little bit too big. This area left was a little bit too small. So what may be something I could do to get closer to the true area? Let's find an average of those two. Sure. Let's add them together. Let's divide by two. So here we have what is called the right rectangular approximation method. This is the left rectangular approximation method. The right and the left refer to which side is you, the side you're going to figure the height from. And the last one, the too big one, was 11.375, and the too small one was 6.875. And if you said, hey, let's find the average of the two, good thinking, you come up with this number. Do you think that number is a pretty good number for the area there? Yeah, it is. Now, it's not the exact area, but it's pretty good. It's a lot closer than the other things. We're getting closer to it. Can you think of any other things I might do to get closer? Make smaller rectangles, right? Make a smaller slice. Because if I made a smaller slice, then this region here that is not being counted, oh, I start counting more of that region, don't I? When I make smaller slices, I'm cutting smaller the amount that is missing. So let's make smaller slices. Excellent idea. So right here, they made smaller slices. They took 20 rectangles instead of taking 6 rectangles. And we did the average again, because that seemed to be working pretty well for us. And now we got this number. Is that the exact area, do you think, with 20 rectangles? No. But could you guess maybe where we are approaching? Looks like we're getting closer to that number, which actually is the exact value of the area happens to be an integer. It's not always an integer, but it happens to be an integer on this example, where it's exactly 9. There is the idea that we are going to be working with in finding the area under a curve. If I have more and more rectangles, it means my rectangles are smaller and smaller and smaller. Remember what we were doing with those teacups? We were dividing them into smaller and smaller pieces. And in this case, the smaller pieces make it more and more accurate. What do you think would be the real accurate one? How many rectangles do I want to divide it into? I want to divide it into an infinite number of rectangles. Now, I'm not concerned that inside every single one of those infinite number of rectangles, I have an area of zero, because I know when I add all those infinite number of rectangles back together again, I'm going to have the total area that I'm looking for. That's the idea that we are doing here. So, the calculus step is to move from a finite number of rectangles, yielding an approximate area, to an infinite number of rectangles, 
that is going to give us the exact area that is under the curve. So it brings us to an integral. The first thing we did was a derivative. The idea of what a derivative was, rate of change, slope. Now we are going to be looking at an integral, which on a graph is the area under a curve, between that curve and the x-axis. So we have a sum of this is the height of the rectangle. What did we do to get the height? Do you remember? Yeah, it's the value of the function at that point. If it was the height at 2, I just put a 2 back in. That's why it says f of x sub i. f of whatever the x value I'm putting in. And I start with my first rectangle value. Starts at 1. Delta x, what do you think that means? Yeah, delta x, if I'm talking about rectangles, is the what? The width of each rectangle. That's how wide it is. F of x is how tall it is. Delta x is how wide it is. All this is is the area of a rectangle based on height. That's all that thing is right over there. And I want to take the sum of it from 1 to, well, how many rectangles do you want to divide it into? 6 of them? 20 of them? Or we really want infinite number of them because that will give us an exact thing. So here we go. Let f be a function defined on the interval from a to b. So I've got this function, whatever it is. I'm going to start at this point here, which is a, and I'm going to go to b. So all they are saying is I actually have the function there. It has to be defined. That's all that means. Then let this be defined as above, right there what we were talking about. Then the definite integral, and when we put the term definite, we find the number. You know when we were doing derivatives, when we had, we wanted to find the derivative at 4? Well, we got a number answer out of that. But if I didn't want the derivative at 4, I just wanted the derivative of the equation, I got an equation out of it. Well, the first one would be called, a, it, it, we don't call them definite derivatives, but that's the idea. I have an exact number. So when I'm finding in a definite integral, I'm finding the exact number. We can have integrals. Where we don't get the number, we get an equation. But this is a definite integral. We're going to get the number answer out of it. So the definite integral over a to b is written this way. Here's the notation of it. Now let me tell you where this thing comes from. This thing right over here is like a big S for summation. Remember, this notation means summation. That's where it comes from. So that's like S, the summation. I'm starting at A, I'm stopping at B. I really need to put that right there. I'm stopping at B, from A to B. A is where I start, B is where I stop. So this is really just a different notation that matches that right there. It's saying the same thing. The definite integral from A to B of the function with respect to X. That's what that means. Remember when we saw the derivative with respect to x. Now we have a definite integral with respect to x. Again, this part is just telling us what is the variable in the formula that we are going to be integrating. Earlier, what's the variable that we're going to be um, derivating? I think that's the word. Finding the derivative of. And when we and we'll cover some calculus rules after this chapter. That will tell us what do I apply the calculus rules to. Right now, it doesn't really mean anything to it, except you need to know that's what that is. And so they're saying, hey, in order to get this, we call that a definite integral because we're going between A and B. In order to find that definite integral, this is how we can do it. That's the formula that does it for us. And we're going to run our n to infinity, from 1 to infinity, because we want the exact area. And if that limit exists, then we say that this function is integrable. You can integrate it. That's all that means. It can be integrated in that region. So let's look at this one right over here. We're not going to do the calculus of it. We're going to do this other idea we've been working with. But it sets you up for what does it mean when we're doing the calculus, the integrating. 
this is what it means. This is what we're doing. So here they've told us to find the definite integral of 2x with respect to x from 1 to 5. So this is my equation right there. And I start at 1, I stop at 5, and if I'm finding the definite integral, I'm finding the area under the curve. You now can read this notation and know what we are doing. That's what we're doing. We're having the equation 2x. Here's the equation 2x. There it goes, that blue line. And we want to go from 1 to 5. So we want to start at 1, we want to stop at 5, and we want to find the area under this. That will be the answer to that definite integral. What shape do we have? Go back to our geometry. That's a trapezoid. Remember, a trapezoid has two parallel sides, one pair of parallel bases, I should say, and then a pair of non-parallel sides. Now, do you remember the area formula for a trapezoid? That's the next question. Can you finish it? There it is, base 1 plus base 2. There's the area formula for a trapezoid. We had a rectangle, that was easy. We had a triangle, that was easy. Now we have a trapezoid, now we remember the formula, so that's easy. I just need to fill it in and I can figure out this definite integral. One half of the height. Where is the height of a trapezoid? The answer is 4. The height of a trapezoid is the distance between the bases. That's the height of the trapezoid. So this trapezoid is kind of on its side. The height is the distance between the bases. What are, what are the bases then in my trapezoid here? They are these two parallel sides. Those are my bases. How tall is this first base? What is it? Two. two. How'd you get two? Yeah. At 1, what's the value of the function? At 1, 2 times 1 is 2. That's the value of the function. We know how to do that now. What's the height over here? That is 10. Because at 5, I put a 2 times 5, which is 10. There we go. Half of 4 is 2. 2 and 10 are 12. What's 2 times 12? There's the definite integral of 2x with respect to x from 1 to 5. Okay? The math we are doing right now is geometry in order to get the answer. Now, can you see the breakdown in our method we are using, though? Do we have geometry to get this one? No, we don't have geometry to get this one. So we have to get, not today, yes we will, not today. So we have to get back to, well, I know how to find it, I do this, and I can do that by making more and more triangles, rectangles. Today you will be making rectangles to get it. So today you will be doing this to get areas when they're under curves that aren't Is constant. Okay? Oh, yes. We will. Example number five. Suppose a ball rolls down a ramp so that its velocity after t seconds is always 2t feet per second. How far does it roll during the first three seconds? Is this the same one that we just did? Nine feet. <laughs> Remember, we have a velocity versus time graph. 2t is this equation right there. There's y equals 2t, or f of x equals 2t, or f of t equals 2t, I should say. Let's not say y. Let's say f of t. And we are going to do it, what, for three seconds? What's the shape, Ashton, of that area? That's a triangle. We're going to find the area, one-half base times height. One-half the base is what? Three. How do you get the height? We know how to get it, don't we? Three times two, or two times three, which is six. Sure enough, that was six. Three, three times three is nine. <laughs> it's nine. What are we? Feet squared. <laughs> All right, I think I am done. Yeah, so you guys are going to be working geometrically finding areas under it when it's a geometric shape, or when it's not, we are going to be working on rectangles, and they may ask for the right hand or the left hand rectangular method, RAM or LRAM, and maybe they'll ask for an average of them so we can estimate it. So that's where we are today.